we drew their fire. They started shooting up at us. Uh, and as we were engaging back down on them, um, a lucky round came, bounced off the door, and went down through both of my legs. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. When I walked up to my recruiter, I told him, hey, I don't want to sit behind a desk ever, which coincidentally I do a lot of now, but uh, uh, we all do eventually in our careers. But um, yeah, I, I told him, hey, I don't want to sit behind a desk. What have you got for me that's outside? He uh, said, yeah, you're in pretty good shape. He's like, I got combat control, pararescue. What do you think of each? And I really like the medical aspect of pararescue. Uh, so I signed up for it right there. Before we get too far along, some folks not, might not know what pararescue is. So explain what, what role you and your unit had. Okay, so uh, pararescue men are recovery specialists. Basically, we're trained to go into and get out of any type of environment, whether it's uh, the ocean, uh, Arctic, jungles, deserts, um, and be able to recover whoever we're going after, um, whether or not they're, it's extrication stuff, if they are trapped inside of a vehicle that's smashed or a uh, housing structure that's smashed, um, being able to do high angle stuff, confined space rescue, um, we're just a jack of all trades of being able to get where we need to be and get our people back safe. Well, we were deployed in uh, Sangin Valley uh, down in the Helmand province. Uh, we were stationed out of Camp Bastion down there, and it was right away hot. Um, it was, you know, everything there was kicking off uh, long before I got there. And in 2011, 2010, 2011 time frame is when that area, everybody was, was angry down there. So right off the bat, we were automatically running missions immediately. So our changeover was pretty, pretty quick with the team in, ahead of us. Um, and they just pretty much was like, told us to strap it on and get going. Because the first day we were actually on duty, we were already out doing eight missions that day. So. The first one actually wasn't a typical mission. Uh, the first one I, I went on actually ended up being a uh, local national. Um, it was a child who had been very badly burned. Uh, that's what we got the call for. It was really badly burned and we were supposed to transport from where they were in their compound. Their parents had brought them to a local fob where they were at. Um, and we were just going out there to transport them. Um, they sent us because there was still fire going on around that uh, particular location. So, I mean, we fly our 60s with weapons on them. So, yeah, we went in to go get this person, and it turns out that his father uh, had been the cause of his burns. It was a typical, you could see the, the perfect ring where he had dipped him down in a pot uh, just so that he could get on one of our birds uh, and cause some destruction. And uh, we ended up thwarting that effort and, you know, taking care of the father um, on the ground there and before he could get on the bird and taking the child and transporting him back to our hospital to get care. Talk about how the process works. How do you get the call? How do you assemble quickly and, and get to wherever you need to go? So while we're on alert, uh, all of our stuff is already pre-staged in the helicopters. The only thing we're missing is, is us and sometimes our weapons. We won't uh, just leave them out there on the flight line. Um, and then once the call comes over into the rock or the jock um, over there, we go ahead and it, they determine, they break it down which of the rescue efforts is going to pick it up. And when it's determined that it's going to be us, usually if it's a cat alpha, meaning the most serious that it can be, um, and usually if it's troops in contact or if it's a dangerous situation, uh, they'll send us because, like I said, we have our weapons still on. We either fly with 50 cals on each side or mini guns on each side, plus all of us with M4s sticking out the back. Um, so once that comes down, you know, we just head out and take all the, we get the basic rundown, the nine line of uh, what we have, and we'll write it down. And then as we go, we get more information. We'll hit up the pilots and say, hey, ask for X, Y, Z. So. More often than not, was there still combat going on when you would get there, or did it vary from site um, to site? It, it varied from site to site. Sometimes we'd go to FOBs where it's, it's a little more calm, um, so because they were able to transport from the initial point of injury to the closest FOB where they can you know, stabilize somebody, and we'd just fly in and pick them up. Um, but quite often we'd go into uh, locations where they are actually troops in contact and you know we lay down suppressive fire before we come in and you know that kind of gets everybody to duck their heads we're able to get in get who we need or at least get our guys on the ground and push off our helicopters so that uh, 
were able to treat and then call them back in. So you engaged the enemy fairly frequently? Yeah, uh, I'd say about every day we were at least taking fire. Um, sometimes just due to the you know, rules that we have, you can't re-engage unless you can actually positively identify. Uh, so, you know, they're taking pop shots out of trees and out of fields and stuff where you can't exactly see where they're coming from. Uh, but yeah, it's several times when we were on the ground, you know, we had to engage because we could see where they were coming from. And, you know, the first way to protect your patient is to fire back, not to just keep treating. So. All right. Let's talk about July 15th, 2011. Um, this is, uh, the mission where you were injured. You mentioned you were in Sangin province in Afghanistan. Tell us what was happening that day and how it all unfolded. Day like like all the others, you know, came out. We had just started really early in the morning. I believe our first mission, we, we get on shift at midnight. Um, and I think our first mission was probably about an hour after that. Um, and we had gone through the day running a couple of smaller missions, pickups of some critically injured uh, personnel. And as we were coming back from our third that day we got re-rolled, so that means as we were flying back, we got another call that said, hey, you're heading right back out the door as soon as you touch down and drop off your patient. So um, when we dropped off, a couple of us ran out, we refitted our med gear, we had some people wash out the back of the helicopter and refit our ammunition. Um, and then, you know, they hot field and we started heading back out the door. The initial call came for a troops in contact. It was a Marine and ANA team um, together, they were on patrol, uh, started taking fire, and one had been hit and was critically injured. So at that time, we had one patient. We always fly two ships, uh, two HH-60 helicopters, the Paybox. And uh, I was on the lead uh, with my Crow combat rescue officer and my team leader, and I was the lead medic for the team. And then on the trail helicopter, we had three PJs um, consisting of an element leader and two team, t team members. Um, we take turns going into the zone, which bird's going to land, uh, de sometimes depending on patient needs, but mostly just, you know, each mission, uh, it gives the uh, one bird time in the zone and practice, and also it gives the other bird time doing overwatch and kind of mentally helps with both aspects so you're not constantly under fire or uh, in the hot zone. So it was our time as lead to go in. And um, by the time we got there, we had gotten word that there were two other patients. So that made uh, three critically injured patients. I immediately made the call to give it to the trail bird because they had three PJs on board. So it was better patient care. Uh, two, I could have handled three. It's just better, you know, one patient per PJ. Um, so we became the overwatch bird. And as we came into the zone and called for the smoke on the ground, they popped it. Um, we popped up over that smoke to draw any fire that there might be because it's, you know, it's a big thing for them to be able to take it, take down the rescue birds. Um, and it worked like a charm. We, uh, we drew their fire. They started shooting up at us. Uh, and as we were engaging back down on them, um, a lucky round came, bounced off the door and went down through both of my legs. Um, I didn't realize that it was a bullet at first. I really thought a flare, because we have flares on the helicopter that pop off, whether we're engaged by rockets or sometimes they pop off if we go over a really hot heat source like a campfire and we're flying really low. So I thought a flare had hit me in the leg. Uh, so I made that call over the radio. I said, I think a flare just hit me in the leg. And my team leader said, are you really? And I said, yeah. And as I looked, that's when all my musculature and everything moved and that's where I felt the pain. Uh, called back over the radio, said I'm hit. Uh, that's a very calm way of saying it. There was there was a lot more yelling involved, manly yelling. Um, but I uh, pulled myself back in the helicopter, uh, ripped off my tourniquet, my crow put the tourniquet off on my left leg, uh, and then he put his own tourniquet on my right leg. Uh, and pretty much I was dosed with a great amount of ketamine and had a great ride back to uh, Bastion. What do you remember beyond that? after you got back? Uh, well, I remember fighting. I have a, uh, a necklace that I always wear, um, never leaves my neck. Uh, long story short, it was given to my dad by my mom. And then when I was a child, my dad gave it to me. Um, always stays on me while I was out there. It had ended up breaking. So I had wrapped it around my wallet and kept it in my pocket. Um, and I remember getting back 
them putting me on the, the table, moving me from the gurney to the table. And I woke up just in time to try to reach for my wallet. And they were like, don't worry, all your stuff's going to go. And I, I remember telling them that my necklace never leaves my body. And somebody told me it would be there. And then I passed out. And then when I woke up, they had taped it to my neck. Um, so when I was in the recovery, they had had it taped around my neck, which was awesome. Um, and then my, my team was there as well when I woke up. And first things they told me uh, were the two biggest things on my mind, quite honestly, uh, were, hey, don't worry about those guys because we went right back and we got them out. So now my mind is clear that I didn't affect those people being rescued. Um, and don't worry about the guys that got you because we brought an Apache escort and the Apaches blew up that whole tree line. So revenge done as well. <laughs> Good news, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so what specifically were the injuries? Uh, so I was shot through my left knee from the left side. It went down through my knee, um, blew out the entire lower half of my femur, um, and took out all the ligaments in there. And then it, it exited, leaving probably about a softball size hole in the right side of my knee and went down through my right calf. Went through and through my right calf. Pretty much all it did was uh, it, it took some piece out of my artery and fractured my tibia. Um, but other than that, like they were able to repair the artery um, pretty quickly. Um, they did a fasciotomy on me uh, to, and a fasciotomy is where they cut down the fascia so that any type of swelling happens outside the limb so that way it doesn't cut off blood flow inside the limb. Um, so the, my right leg healed pretty quickly. From Afghanistan, I was sent to launch tool uh, in launch tool is where my brother, who is a combat rescue officer, um, was sent to meet me and get eyes on me for my team. And uh, that's where I was able to re-enlist because I told him I wasn't leaving Afghanistan without my re-enlistment paperwork. I mean, tax-free bonuses, come on. Um, so, yeah, he was able to, to re-enlist me from there. Um, and then from there, I went to San Antonio Military Medical Center where I went the next pretty much three and a half years of, of surgeries and physical therapy. So once you got to San Antonio, there were even more surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, and yet each one, which you hoped would do the trick, didn't do the trick. So at what point did you realize that you might end up losing the lower part of your leg? So, um, you know, the, the whole time that I was there, uh, like you said, I, I had several surgeries. I had 21 in total. Uh, but it was number 20 that was actually the quitting point for me for being a, you know, guinea pig, so to speak. You know, uh, it was supposed to be a knee replacement. I had actually gone to uh, a place where it was supposed to be the top of the line, the people that work on the pro athletes, uh, to go get it done. And he woke me up about halfway through my surgery and told me, hey, um, I just wanted to let you know that this wasn't going to be what I promised you. And before I put this knee in there, I need you to know that it's not going to be a functional leg. Uh, there's just too much scar tissue built up um, from previous surgeries. And, you know, my, my muscle bones and tendons and skin had all adhered down to each other. And they were hard as a rock, pretty much like a bone themselves. So he's like, you're probably going to get about 13 to 14 degrees of flexion, uh, but your pain will be gone. And that was my biggest issue was I was in pain 24 hours a day. I don't like pain meds, so I never took them. Um, and so... I told him, don't worry about it. I was like, I'm, I'm not gonna go the rest of my life with a useless leg. So I told him to, I'm gonna have it amputated. And so he's, he stopped the surgery there. And uh, that's the path I took was my, my amputation route, which um, this was in May of 2014. And my amputation ended up happening in uh, October. And the reason for that delay is because you plan to compete even with your damaged leg. Explain what was going on there. Correct. Uh, I had been chosen for the Warrior Gaze Games team uh, to be on the, the Air Force team for that. And uh, I knew that if I had my amputation, I wouldn't be able to swim, which was my strongest sport. And so I delayed that uh, amputation surgery so that I could go to the Warrior Games in September and uh, crushed it, five gold medals. And so I felt pretty good about it. And that was a, that was a, high to, a good high to ride into my actual uh, surgery. So the leg... Did well on its last mission. Did well just being drug along. I couldn't use it much, but uh, <laughs> it came along for the ride. And uh, so talk about the surgery. Uh, when you came out of that, where were you physically and mentally? 
So, uh, I mean, it's an amputation, right? So I went into the surgery uh, pretty much surrounded by people that I love, good friends. Um, and I had you know, been there long enough that I made friends with most of the hospital staff as well. So most of the people that had been on past surgeries of mine were in the room and made jokes. They, they wrote all over my leg in uh, medical marker. And I, you know, it made the doctor mad at first. He, he's like, I take this seriously. And I looked at him, I was like, look, this makes me feel better. And he calmed down, he realized, he's like, you're right, you know, this is for you. Um, so I went into it with all kinds of things written on over the leg. One of my buddies wrote removed before flight, which is a flight tag that goes on airplanes that, uh, but that was pretty funny. Um, so beginning of the surgery, totally positive about it. Uh, after the surgery, I woke up, um, I looked down, I saw that the sheets ended so far down my leg and, uh, kind of had a breakdown. Um, that lasted for about 15 minutes. My father was in the room with me. Um, he looked at me and said, son, you made this decision and now you're going to push forward. And, um, and then he had to point out that I didn't realize, but I was shaking my residual limb around while I was nervously crying. Uh, and when he pointed that out, it seems like a weird thing, but it was such a relief to me because I had gone through years of not being able to move that leg at all without just excruciating pain and having to like grab it and adjust it. Uh, so being able to just move it back and forth, even just nervously and not feel any pain, I was, I was ecstatic about that. And then my mindset completely changed from that moment. And I've been fully positive about it since then. We talked about how your goal after being injured was to re-enlist. And then as soon as you had the amputation done, your goal was to get back to active duty and even rejoin pararescue, which I don't believe anybody had ever done given those circumstances before. So talk about your mindset and what was physically required to be able to reach that goal. So uh, after the amputation, uh, I was pretty positive that, well, at least in my own head, that as long as I could get up on a prosthetic and and actually start running and start moving again, that I'd be able to go back to duty. Uh, the only reason I thought that is because I had had several years in physical therapy now watching amputees get up and run and start their new way of life and be able to be just as active as they were before. Uh, so as soon as I had a prosthetic, I knew like my goal was to go back to the job that I was lo I loved doing. Um, and you know it was it was difficult it was difficult learning to walk again learning to run run again um but but once i did you know i was i was charging forward at full steam uh, i had a med board that was an initial med board basically they just take all your paperwork look at it very objectively and say hey based on what this look this looks like uh we're gonna permanently retire you so that was the decision that was made i was going to be permanently retired 40 percent disability thank you for your service have a nice day um, and I kind of looked at it and I was like, well, I, uh, I don't want anything to do with that. I want a formal med board, which is where they actually sit in a panel with you and a lawyer. Um, and I wanted anybody that was going to tell me that I didn't have to be, or that I wasn't going to be in the military to look me in the face and tell me it. Um, they told me it would be about eight months before that board happened because they need to process on their side and I need to uh, get stuff ready on my side. So, uh, I set about my goal, um, which was to prove to them that everything that I could do in order to say, hey, I am fit for duty. So I went and did the Bataan Death March in the military heavy class. Uh, from there, I went and did a crevasse rescue course up in Alaska, um, which coincidentally was one of the courses that we actually take as PJ. So I was able to prove that, hey, I'm able to do PJ training as well. Uh, I went and did at the, behind SAMC, they have an obstacle course with all kinds of things. And I went and did every movement that I could think of, patient drags, patient carries, wall climbs, rope climbs. I even did the monkey bars. Uh, whatever I thought that they were going to say, hey, you can't do this movement, uh, so you can't be a PJ. So I did it, I filmed it, and I made sure that they had all that information for my formal board. Um, ended up going into it and they told me it'd be a day before I got my results and a week and a day later I got a phone call to say Texas Iron O'Neill uh, you have been fully returned to duty uh, as a pararescueman. So I was the first pararescueman to be uh, returned to duty as an active duty pararescueman. Uh, about eight months after me there was another pararescueman same injury uh, that has been returned to duty. He fortunately he's a guardsman 
um, and he has been able to deploy a couple times. I have not been able to deploy. There's been uh, a lot of red tape put in front of me, and whether that's because it's active duty versus guard or whatever, I don't know. Um, but there's there's been a lot of ups and downs with me starting training again, turning training off, starting training. So I have jumped, I have dove, I have done all the training that uh, I used to do, but never in a full capacity to um, go back to a deployment yet. All right, we talked about your performance at the Warrior Games uh, while you still had uh, your full leg. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you start to get focused on uh, the Invictus Games and, and additional Warrior Games after your surgery? So the Invictus Games, I mean, everybody wanted to jump at that opportunity as soon as uh, I remember when Prince Harry had come over and uh, was interested in just watching the Warrior Games. And, you know, I remember him saying that he wanted to do the same thing. And then when they made the announcement that it wasn't going to be just a Warrior Games in England, but he was going to make the Invictus Games as a worldwide type thing, um, everybody wanted to get on it. it was, it's awesome. It's a, it's, you know, it's a bigger stage than the Warrior Games. You're competing against, you know, the people that you fought with uh, beforehand. Um, so I was, I was excited to to try out, you know, for the for the team and excited when I got picked up for the 2016 Invictus in Orlando. And what events did you specialize in? Uh, so when I went to the Orlando Invictus, I did swimming. Um, I ended up tearing something in my, my shoulder, my, my first swim, so I didn't get to finish it out, which was quite upsetting. Um, but we still ended up winning gold in like seated volleyball. Um, so I got a gold medal for that. Um, but we did, we did really well. I was glad to just continue to be there to support the team. Um, and then when we did the Invictus this past year in 2022 in the Netherlands, uh, got to come back, you know, got to actually do my swimming. Um, I medaled in every swim event that I did. Um, I've gotten two bronze, two silver and a gold medal this year. What's your message to others who have been injured or wounded or for some other reason are suddenly facing a much different life than they had probably expected? Uh, yeah, I mean, life isn't about, you know, if you're going to fall. So if you're, you know, planning to go through life unscathed, it's, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, always live your life for when you fall, what you're going to do on the backside of that. Um, it's, it's all about having small goals because the small goals always equal big wins. And, uh, it's kind of daunting when people are like, Hey, I'm going to do this. And it's a huge goal that they have. And then they kind of scare themselves out of not doing it. Uh, I, I attest that if you set small goals for yourself leading up to that, um, even as small as making your bed, eating the proper meal that you want to eat, whatever it may be. Um, I promise you will have those bigger wins because, um, it's, it's just easier when you're, when you're winning every day and every week and every month, you're, you're definitely going to win out on your ultimate goal in the end. Uh, what are you most proud of from your time in service? It's not even being in the service. It's, it's uh, my family, honestly. I've got a little six-year-old daughter who is, you know, that's my legacy, and she's, she's awesome. It's probably one of the best things that has happened to me to, to – help with my mindset and, you know, just help with me pushing forward for her. Um, she's every bit of my goofy personality and every bit of her mom's attitude and beauty. And uh, it's a perfect mixture in a little human being.